and welcome to this Q&A, um, part of a series to accompany the Creative Essentials book, uh, The Art of Screen Adaptation. Um, I'm Alistair Owen, I'm the author of the book, um, and I'm delighted to be joined tonight by one of the writers in that book. Um, as uh, Nadine says, a BAFTA-winning screenwriter, best-selling novelist, and important to uh, remember, a tireless supporter of other writers. I'm always incredibly impressed when I see on Twitter how much time he spends promoting the work of other writers. Um, so David Nichols, welcome. Hello, hi, very nice to, to have so many people here. I'm having to cover up the bit where, which shows me how many people are in the room because it's making me so <laughs> nervous. And there's always a worry when you see the numbers going down that you're, you're becoming incredibly boring and you need to get it back up again, like a kind of Geiger counter. So <laughs> thank you all for coming. Um, so in the book, we focused on David's adaptations of Blake Morrison's memoir, And When Did You Last See Your Father? and Edward St. Albans' Patrick Mulrose novels. Tonight we're going to talk a bit more about his dramatizations of Hardy and Dickens um, and his film and TV adaptations of his own novels, uh, Start of Ten, One Day and Us. Uh, we're going to chat, as Nadine says, for about 30 minutes, um, then we'll open it up to questions about any of David's screenwriting work, uh, which you can ask via the chat. Um, I'll be monitoring those during the interview as well as uh, consulting my notes. So if I'm looking down or off to the side at any point, that's not because I've lost interest in what David is saying. You're on Facebook. <laughs> um, congratulations, David, first of all, on Us, um, which gave a lot of people, including me, a bit of a lift seven months into lockdown. Um, when I first read the novel six years ago, I remember thinking, best-selling book, warm and witty story, written in handy scene-sized sections, this is bound to be adapted. Was its journey from page to screen as straightforward as I imagined it might be? Well, I thought the opposite. You see, I, I have this terrible radar, which, which goes all the way, all the time I'm reading any novel, which is how would you adapt this? It's a terrible uh, thing to have, the, that voice in your head. But us does lots of things which are terrifically difficult to do on, on, on the screen. It's a lot about memory. Uh, it's a, a first person narrator. There's this great gulf between what Douglas thinks and what he says. So there's an internal monologue which is wildly different from, from his behavior. Um, it, it's very fluid in its movement uh, through time. It's very fluid in its geographical movement, so it's expensive. Um, and it's a very solipsistic book. You know, it's uh, some first person, uh, uh, narrative voices in a novel are quite neutral. They could almost be a third person. You could change I to he or she, and the story would might remain the same broadly. But but this is a very strong narrative voice, and you're going to lose most of the book immediately as soon as you start to dramatize it. So uh, to me, it wasn't an obvious choice. At the same time, it was influenced by by a, a, a certain type of filmic story, I suppose. I mean, I, I everything I've written on the page has had a had some influence from from screen because uh, I love all those mediums equally. So there was certainly um, a strong character there. Uh, there was a kind of propulsive narrative forward drive in that it was a kind of hunt, a, a chase. So that seemed to be adaptable, but it was uh, difficult. Yeah, it was extremely difficult because you 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 um instinctively when you have a first person voice you think oh well we'll try voiceover and voiceover is a very wearying thing it, you, you can use it I think when there's a difference between the voice what the voiceover is saying and what's happening but there's always a question um of why is this person telling us this you know who are they talking to if the format is a diary or a journal or letters there's a justification for this voice um expressing something different to what's happening. So uh, Bridget Jones or Adrian Mole, you know, there's a structure to the voiceover which gives it some justification, but you can't just slap voiceover on things so that you can squeeze in the jokes and observations. You have to have a reason for it. So even though there were drafts which had voiceover, that got cut pretty quickly. And then when you don't have voiceover, when you only have what Douglas says and does, there's a danger that he becomes uh, a little bit monotonous, a little bit unlikable, perhaps a little bit unsympathetic. So you have to make sure that his behavior and his, that you have to find ways to get his intentions 
into the action, even if they're unexpressed. And that often is the challenge with adapting a very um, internal book, is how can I get him to say the things which he would never dream of saying, especially without a confidant, you know, without a best friend or without someone to be entirely honest with, or, a, you know, a diary to talk to. And that was the biggest challenge. And then, of course, there are other challenges to do with the logistics of shooting abroad, uh, the fact that you're going to have to cut a lot of the cities, the fact that you're going to have to find out more about the other characters because now they exist in an objective three-dimensional world rather than through the eyes of Douglas. So you're going to have to flesh out certain things that in the book don't necessarily, aren't necessarily explored fully. So there are a great many challenges, uh, but I'm very proud of it, I think. And I, I owe a huge debt, I think, to the actors, because actors can provide you with a, a kind of living interior monologue. They can show the thoughts, uh, uh, the, 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 the intentions, even when what they're saying doesn't quite match up. That sort of ties in with something that um, Jeremy Brock says in the book, which is, in his, in his experience, in a sense, the actors almost bring a new level of adaptation to the, to the room. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And and it's very unpredictable. You never really know what they're going to bring until you're kind of in the edit suite and people are responding to it. Uh, but it's it's thrilling. I mean, it's why for me it's exciting, but why I think that they're two very different things. I mean, most of the text, I would say 90% of the, the text of the novel doesn't really exist in the TV dramatization because there's no room in a dramatization for metaphor or observation or memory or sense you know, none of those things are going to be there, but you are going to have action, you are going to have dialogue, and you're going to have these brilliant actors who are going to provide so much of the, the character's complexity, and also you're going to have other elements, um, the mood uh, of the cinematography, the things that the music adds, and in all those departments I, I, I had a really good time on us, so I'm, I'm very pleased with it, even though I think it's a very different entity to the novel. I'm always interested, you mentioned there the music and cinematography, I'm always, I'm increasingly interested these days as I'm watching a scene that's beautifully lit and, and beautifully scored, particularly montage sequences or sequences which depend very much on a, on a score rising to a crescendo. And um, I'm starting to get interested in, in the extent to which, and this isn't specifically yeah. a question about adaptation, this is just screenwriting generally, but it's just of interest to me. Um, how much individual writers are able to envisage that kind of thing when they're writing the script? I think about it a lot. I mean, probably too much, uh, because uh, in a way, a reading draft, a script that you're trying to get commissioned to get to get green lit, you know, it can, I think, have a, it's okay to embellish it a little bit with um, pointers. So I've just written a, an adaptation of Sweet Sorrow, my last book, where music is very important as a way both uh, of not just of establishing the time, which is 1997, but mood. And I was thinking, because it's another great coming of age story of The Graduate, and there's a bit in The Graduate where the action stops and they play one Simon and Garfunkel song, and then they play another straight after. And it's a, um, it's a good seven minutes of, of, of music montage. And I too am fascinated as to what that looks like on the page. But I think that's probably something that comes, uh, comes up in discussions with the director and the screenwriter working together. So the notes that I make in the script are kind of serving suggestions, if you like, and I'm, I'm open for the fact that we probably won't get those tracks. And obviously that doesn't work with composition, even though I will, uh, um, with us, I was able to confer as, as one of the executive producers to confer with the composer and say, you know, I'd like it to have this feel, perhaps a kind of wistful major minor feel, a kind of waltz feel uh, um, to, um, to, to just provide some input and some of that will go into the script. I do also, sorry, I, I, do, I hope this doesn't get too technical. When I'm writing a screenplay, I do also try and get some of that sense of rhythm into the way the script is laid out on the page, where you put the paragraphing in, that sense of, you can establish weirdly a sense of montage with words on the page if you think carefully about how it's, how it's structured uh, for the reader. I think that's absolutely true. That's not something that's talked about very often. And I think individual writers probably can sometimes tend to feel a little bit nerdy if they're spending time doing that, thinking, am I, yeah. am I wasting my time here? But actually, I think it's almost like poetry sometimes. It is important where you exactly. break the line. Um, yeah, I never put, you know, we pan, we zoom. I never do any of that. But I will put, I will think carefully about paragraphs, just as I think about paragraphing when I'm writing prose. 
Well, I can think of an example from us, actually. I, I read um, episode one yesterday, episode two this morning, um, and there's a moment uh, in episode two, I think, where you describe um, Douglas putting his hand on Albie's... D Douglas puts his hand on Albie's shoulder. That's yeah. one paragraph. Mm -hmm. Next paragraph, he leaves it there for a moment. Next paragraph, then he removes it. And that's, I was thinking of that as a writer, I was reading it, I was thinking, would I do it that way? I might just have it all on one line with two spaces between each sentence. I'm, no, I think that's really good. You've, you've really conveyed something there in very few words. Yeah, I think um, you know, one of the big differences, I mean, I'm sure we'll come on to this, but one of the big differences in, 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 in writing prose, a, a novel and a screenplay is, in a novel, I have no control over how the book is experienced. You know, you might take three months to read it. You might read it in a single sitting. Uh, you, 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 but with a script, particularly once it's made and you're in the edit suite, but also when you're writing it, you're trying to give the same experience of time to everyone who is watching. So you're hoping that they're going to watch it in a single sweep, that they're going to be gripped all the way through, that they're going to cry at this point, that they're going to be excited at this point. And you're trying to put the pacing into the page and then into the, in the hope that it'll then transfer into the production and onto the screen. And in, particularly in the edit, you, we spend a lot of time thinking about pacing. How can we pick this up? How can we make this really exciting? How can we make this sustain interest, even if perhaps there isn't a lot of action? And uh, that's a very different uh, process to prose where actually prose you can press pause and you can press pause and go into the character's interior, interior thoughts or describe something or have a sense memory or a little mini flashback that will never make it to the screen uh, but the the way you uh, control time differently uh, is is vastly different between uh, fiction and on screen. You, you said earlier about not being able to do memory but of course you can in a sense because the the, the the series is structured with flashbacks. There's, there's quite yeah. a lot of flashbacks. So that is a way of showing memory, and not necessarily in the way that you can show it on the page. Yes, I think you're using memory in, in, a, in a more narrative way, often in a, uh, I'm, I, again, with Sweet Sorrow, I was just, there's a sequence in Sweet Sorrow, the school disco, where he, he talks about his memories of his first kiss. And it's a little, a little um, descriptive paragraph. And with prose, you can very quickly, you know, I remember when I was 12 or three months ago, or when you're writing a screenplay, it's a big deal to jump back three months. You know, it's a whole different world. You know, are you going to change the hair? Is it going to be a different world? It's a, it's a, to, to leap around in time. When I was writing the novel of us, it was, it was very easy to leap around through the 25 years of their relationship in a non-chronological way. When you come to write the screenplay, we thought it probably made sense that rather than having glimpses, rather than having little impressionistic moments, that you would to tell two parallel stories. The structure of us, both on the screen and, and, and on the page, is that you have two narratives. Um, one is taking 25 years and the other is taking three weeks. And they're both going to end in the same point. And one is the story of the marriage and the other is the story of the whole day and they're going to finish there. They're going to come together. Um, what you can't do on screen is crossfade ages. So you have to find a, a, a point at which the, 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 cap, the actor changes. And uh, that's, a, again, a very, very tricky thing to do when you adapt a book. Uh, not all books, I mean, I know we're going to talk about Dickens, but a novel like Great Expectations gives you this lovely jump cut between Pip as a boy to Pip as an adult, because nothing changes in his life. He goes to work in the forge and he stays there until this thing happens. So you have a lovely opportunity to change actors. Whereas with something like us, you're not going to be able to fade between the actors. There's going to have to be a point where you cut off and sort of swap and then the other performer takes over. Um, so you can do memory, but um, you have to have a, a definite approach. With, I know we're not talking about Melrose, but in Melrose, the memory was much more impressionistic. Here's a little moment, here's a little scene, here's a little exchange of dialogue, then we're back in the present. Um, a question which interests me more now that I've written a novel of my own, albeit a short novel, um, is um, whether you, um, especially since all, you've adapted all five of your novels, I imagine Sweet Sorrow will, will see in due course, um, The Understudy, mm -hmm. which is your second novel you adapted, but that's unproduced. Yeah. Nonetheless, now, do you, do you write your novels with half an eye on the adaptation or do you just deal with them as purely as novels while you're writing them and then let the adaptation take care of itself as well? 
I always I, I, I get very defensive with this because it, it feels almost a little bit dishonest to write a novel thinking about the film. Do you know what I mean? And I genuinely I, hand on I agree. Hand do it because I because I, I do want to write the best possible novel. And I do in my fiction, I'm often obsessed with this 20 year gap. You know, this, this, this what, how, how do you get from there to here? But certainly the last three novels, almost a trilogy where there are these 20, 25 year leaps. You know, uh, Sweet Sorrow is narrated by uh, adult Charlie, but the large bulk of the narrative takes place when he's 16. It's phenomenally difficult to do that on screen. It really, really is because you always have a, a, a disconnect when the actor changes, even if the actors are extraordinary. You're always thinking, oh yes, that's the older version of X. And do I believe that? And am I gonna go with that? The actors can be as great, they can be cast beautifully, um, uh, they can spend weeks and weeks and weeks in workshops together to copy each other's uh, intonations and everything, but they're always going to be different personas. And that's always going to have a distancing effect. So with the adaptation of Sweet Sorrow, there is no present day. So it's, in that sense, it's quite a loose adaptation, but probably the, by far the best thing to do. So I don't think of, um, I, I would never dream of thinking, I'd love to do this with a character, but it's going to be very hard to adapt. I always write the book I want to write. And it's undeniably true that I'm really, really, really influenced by film and television. You know, there's a lot of, um, with Sweet Sorrow, you know, I wanted it to be like um, Goodbye Columbus or Franny and Zooey or, uh, uh, you know, classic coming of age summer novels. Um, and uh, but it's also influenced a lot by um, by Gregory's Girl, by the Four Hundred Blows. You know, there's lots of Four Hundred Blows in it. So um, the two things for me intertwine, and um, I you know I, I don't know if that's a good thing. You know, I, I wonder sometimes perhaps if I just stuck to one medium, that, that the work might be uh, richer or more accomplished if I just gave up writing screenplays and wrote and really threw myself into fiction. But the fact is, I love both. And I, I, I'm at the moment loath to give them up, which doesn't mean that I don't think that the novel is a wonderful form that I'm trying to write the best possible version of when I when I sit down to write a book. Absolutely. Um, I've got to ask now, uh, if, in, if you can bring them to mind swiftly, what would be, what were your film influences on um, us? Us? Uh, well, you say this it, came out films influence your novel. Yeah, um, uh, Sideways, I think it has a kind of touch of this sort of American indie movie, maybe Little Miss Sunshine and Sideways, which aren't films I particularly love or adore, you know, they, they, but they're, they're definitely, there's a touch of that there. Bookwise, I thought a lot about John Cheever, uh, his short stories about, you know, buttoned up, seemingly rather boring conservative men who necessarily who, who also have all this great passion inside them. Uh, another pair of books that I really love are by Evan S. Connell, Mr. and Mrs. Bridge, which were adapted for screen, I think, um, uh, also. Um, uh, what else? Um, I, I suppose I thought, oh, there's a very good um, old, uh, Two for the Road, you know, Two for the Road. I, 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 uh, um, it's Albert Finney uh, and um, Audrey Hepburn uh, as a couple whose marriage is falling apart on a trip around Europe. I also thought of books that it's nothing like Tender as the Night, you know, which has a kind of sense of a journey across Europe and a, a marriage dissolving. Uh, um, so lots of, lots of, lots of disparate influences, none of which you would necessarily know in the final version, but things that I, I have as a kind of, you know, literary and filmic uh, and televisual mood board. God, that was pretentious that I've said it now, uh, <laughs> that I kind of have with me both during the writing of the book and the, the adaptations. I think there's all kinds of things about writing that is pretentious if you say that, but you just <laughs> got to do it. Sorry. Yeah, that um, generic bookcase behind me, there's another one. <laughs> Uh, so the TV series of Us tells a story excluding the flashbacks, which cover 23 days in a total of four hours. The film of one day tells a story which covers 24 years in an hour and three quarters. The choice of format, film or TV, and if TV, the number of episodes, really is crucial, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yes. And, uh, and often it's entirely natural. You know, it's, it feels, uh, I, I did an adaptation of Tess and Tess is a four act story, you know, it has uh, the first act is, is everything up to uh, uh, her, um, the, the, the sort of the terrible relationship with Alec. The second episode is the, is the love story with 
with Angel. The third uh, episode is Tess's Fall, and the fourth story episode is, is Angel's Return. And uh, that's a very classic for our structure. You read the book, and I think you'd find it very hard to do it in two parts or five parts. Um, with something like One Day, you know, it's always going to be extremely hard to do that in 110 minutes because it covers it's 21 chapters so that's going to give you five minutes each and the worst thing i think you can do with an adaptation is try and do a synopsis you know you have to be uh very selective in your in your um choices the first cut of one day was about two hours 15 minutes you know, it's much much longer than the finished film so um it's a, because it's such an episodic story probably the natural form for that would be something more episodic um, something like uh, Sweet Sorrow and Start of a Ten, though, they have a very classic film structure in that they have a character who wants something and sets out to achieve it and has obstacles along the way. And I don't think they would work in an episodic uh, way. I think they need the kind of forward momentum, the single uh, flow of action that you have in a feature film. So those instinctively, to me, uh, are, are, are self-contained single episodes. But um, uh, yeah, it's an it, instinctive thing, I think. I think if you can see where the, the end of part is going to come, then you should pursue that. And with something like One Day, probably feature film wasn't the right format for it because, yeah, it was always going to be a kind of canter through. If I were uh, trying to do it in 110 minutes now, I'd probably only do, I do fewer of the key moments from the book. But it's hard when a book is, 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 liked and appreciated because then cutting things becomes uh just seems extremely tough you know people say i hope you've got the bit where and you have to kind of you sort of have to take a little you know sort of find a smile and say no i'm afraid that doesn't really work on film which is often the case you know often the best bits in a novel just don't work on on screen there's a big set piece in sweet sorrow the school disco on screen, uh, on the page, it's 10 minutes of good stuff. On screen, it's probably going to be a minute and a half, if that, because there's nothing in it that does what a screenplay needs to do. Watching One Day Last Night, and I see um, someone um, in the audience has had this same thought, I was struck by how the, a one way to do it would be to do it as um, almost like 20 half hour episodes. 20 half hours. Yeah. One day per half hour. That, that yeah. would be a series I would just adore to watch, I have to say. Well, yeah, I think that does make sense. I don't know. It, it comes up every now and then, but it's a, it's a tricky one. I think the other thing, this is a, maybe a, a little bit of an abstract thing to say, but the, the trick, I think, and I don't know how to do this, is that there's no reason to only show events on that one day. You know, in a book, you can say it's the 15th of July, 1997, 1998, 1999. Uh, how do you tell a viewer that? Well, you do it with a caption at the beginning and, 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 and you hope that the idea sustains. But the, 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 the book relies on the notion that what happens on that day isn't necessarily the most important thing that happens in these characters' lives. It's just a day the significance of which becomes apparent later. So I think the challenge, or one of the challenges in adapting it to that format will be to establish that idea that this is a, a slice of life. You know, the, the premise of the novel was always that it was gonna be like going through a photo album and you'd see little moments uh, that would sum up, that wouldn't necessarily be turning points, but would have a resonance that became significant later. So that would be the challenge, I think. Um. You managed to turn Start of a Ten, which is about the same length as Us and One Day, and covers a year or so, into a beautifully deft feature film of 90 minutes. Did it help that, of your novels, that's the one which best fits into a John Hughes style, boy meets two girls, picks the wrong girl, but finds the right one in the end, romantic comedy format? Yeah, I think so. It's the most, it's the nearest to a romantic comedy I've ever written, I think. And um, and I'm really fond of it. I mean, I haven't watched it since it came out because, you know, it, which isn't saying I, I don't like it. I'm very fond of it. But but you inevitably have another version in your head, which is which is more sophisticated or better or slightly more crafted in, in a different way. I mean, I love the performances and Tom Ford did a great job on directing it. James is amazing in it. It's an amazing cast. I mean, you could never afford to do a sequel because uh, you wouldn't get them all together again. But um yeah, it had a very classic, I mean, for that, the, the big influences were things like Billy Liar, you know, that, that, that have a kind of 
an unfortunate sort of anti-hero kind of every man who makes all kinds of terrible mistakes but is good-hearted and that is a natural uh, feature film format but um the difficult the things that don't work i mean here are the things that are, were difficult with that the book doesn't take place in bristol it takes place in every university you know people thought it was exeter or sheffield or edinburgh you know it could be anywhere as soon as you put that on screen you know as soon as it's university challenge on screen you've got to put something on the front of the uh, of the team uh the, the 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 panel so that's 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 not necessarily a problem but it was a very 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 strong uh single point of view and there's a big here's an example of things that are very hard to attack there's a big set piece in the novel where he goes to a disco and he thinks he's dancing brilliantly and on the page he talks about how everyone's standing around claps and cheers and there's uh, just a, a full of admiration for his brilliant dancing and you the reader knows know that he's making a fool of himself and you read between the lines now on screen there's no reading between the lines there's just what's happening and so we shot that and choreographed it and got all the extras in and it was one of those times where what works brilliantly on the page doesn't work on screen and it's not in the finished film we had to cut it even though it took you know a huge chunk out of our schedule to film and I was learning that all the way through that film, that the things that are funny on the page don't necessarily work when you take away a narrative voice or take away a voice which is doing something different to the action. And the other thing which was tricky is that the book ends on a kind of dying fall. You know, he sort of has a breakdown and, and he's, he's, he's with Rebecca, but he's sort of still writing to Alice and it's, it's quite sour. Uh, and uh, genre is a big... Thing when you make a film people say well what kind of film is it what is it and if it's a romantic comedy it's very hard to pull off that muted bittersweet thing you have to really give a kind of you know the run to the airport so the film has a has a classic run to the airport which i'm not crazy about uh, suddenly there's a voiceover for no real reason and suddenly it's very simplistically romantic and all of those things you know would make it a hard watch for me even though i still um am very proud of it as a piece of work i I can see things that I would do differently. Well, you know this, but uh, I absolutely love it. It's one of my favourite one of my favourite comedies. I watch it at least once a year, usually more often. And anyone who hasn't seen it, I can't recommend it highly enough. I think it's. I mean, uh, it's lovely to hear that, and it's a it's a great relief and surprise because when we released it, uh, uh, they said, "Look, we're going up against this film called Borat, but it's you know it's wild and crazy. No one's going to go and see that." And uh, Casino Royale is coming out the same week, but you know we're not sure about James Bond and it's an antidote to James Bond and who knows how that's going to do. And it completely flopped, you know, it completely disappeared. We were all hoping for a big, you know, British comedy hit and it wasn't, uh, which was very tough at the time, but people still watch it now and feel warmly towards it. So that's, that's good to hear. Um, so you've adapted two books by Thomas Hardy, um, Tess of the Gerbervilles for TV in 2008. Um, Far From Running Crowd for film in 2015 and of course you also adapted um, Great Expectations again for film <clears throat> in 2012. Watching particularly uh, recently Tess and Far From the Madding Crowd in the last week or so I was struck afresh by how melodramatic the plots of Victorian novels can be and the central role that coincidence plays in them. Mm. Um, do you have to embrace that in adapting them, especially if they're much loved novels, or do you try and tone those elements down at all? Um, I think you, you, you're right that, that there's no easy equivalent for melodrama. You know, there's no, it, it isn't, a, uh, there are, obviously there are, melodrama exists on film, but it's a difficult thing if suddenly the audience starts to laugh, if they lose, especially in a tragedy, but there's, uh, well, certainly, uh, Far From the Madding Crowd is a strange hybrid of tragedy and comedy. It's almost like a Shakespearean problem play. The premise is pure Shakespeare comedy. She has to choose between uh, friendship, sex and money. You know, it's a, it, it's a very wonderful romantic comedy setup. But, it, but there's also a scene where she has to pry the lid off the coffin of her husband's dead lover and to find a dead baby. And that's a, a difficult thing. And you, you, you have to talk a lot with the director and, and, and you worry about pulling it off. And, and, you know, I think Carrie pulls off those scenes of high melodrama really beautifully and brilliantly. We did um, pull back on a couple of things. For instance, at the very end where Troy uh, turns up at the wedding, uh, uh, Troy turns up at the Christmas uh, party and ruins Boldwood's plan. 
that in the novel is extremely melodramatic. There's a bit where Boldwood puts the gun in his mouth and Gabriel Oak pulls the gun away. And it was all a bit much. And um, Hardy's dialogue is quite uh, high. You know, it's quite, it can be quite verbose. It's full of classical references. Uh, and, and you do have to pull back on that, I think. But not always. I'll give you an example. Um, there's a sequence where Boldwood uh, proposes marriage to Bathsheba. And as I said, Hardy's dialogue, unlike Dickens's dialogue, Dickens's dialogue is quite theatrical and straightforward and direct and vivid. And Hardy can say things a little too often. Uh, and the, the sentences can be quite convoluted. And um, there's a scene where Boldwood says, you know, I ask, will you marry me? And I just had Bathsheba saying, uh, I'm, I'm, no, I cannot. And Kerry Mulligan, reading the novel, really wanted to keep in the line that Hardy had written, which was something like, I do not find it in my heart uh, to find those emotions which would allow me to say yes. And my inclination as a screenwriter is always to make dialogue colloquial, you know, to turn cannot to can't and to make uh, things natural. And uh, if you watch the finished film, we, we eventually used uh, Hardy's you know, after a certain amount of discussion, used Hardy's line, and Kerry does a brilliant thing with it. She, she embraces the, I never know whether the word is archaic or arcane, but the slightly old fashioned nature of the dialogue and uses it for emotion. So she, I'm not gonna do it, you'll have to watch the film, but yeah, I cannot find it in my heart to, she uses the awkwardness of the dialogue to express the awkwardness of the character. So you do learn things like that along the way that often, um, what makes uh, the novels feel a little bit, uh, not old fashioned, but out of time is, is a wonderful thing. And melodrama when it works can be fantastic. But, um, you know, the, the blood coming through the ceiling in, in, in Tess is, is melodramatic, but it's wonderful and, and, and vivid and cinematic. I think it's very, that's uh, okay. This is a whole a digression that could go on and on. So I'll come back to it. Okay. Um, so over Christmas, I had a I had a bit of a Great Expectations fest. Um, Tony Marchant's yeah. atmospheric two-parter from 1999, Sarah Phelps's dark and gritty three-part version from 2011, um, which I talked to her about in the book, um, and your more Dickensian film version from 2012. And it's particularly interesting to compare yours and Sarah's, as her choices were radically different from yours. Um, yeah. You seem to have stuck to Dickens's plot and dialogue where possible, um, and Sarah's happy to dispense with both and write her own new scenes to, to serve the story she wants to tell. How do you feel about your version now, and would you make the same choices if you were adapting it now? Um, I mean, I should say that I think probably Sarah's approach is right, because um, the problem with Great Expectations is I love it way too much. You know, I, it's my favourite novel. And you shouldn't necessarily adapt your favorite novels. I don't subscribe to the idea that you, you know, should you should adapt books that you don't care about, and you should tear them up and move them around and 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 and, 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 and be very um, irreverent with them. I, I do, uh, I have, I do love all of the books that I adapt, but Great Expectations, I love a bit too much. And th this is sacrilegious to say, but I was always, I was never a big fan of David Lean's version. Uh, he makes big simplifications in the plot. And I think also David Lean established a style for performing Dickens on screen that we've sort of stuck to, the idea of what Dickensian acting is. And um, you know, quite big, uh, it's, they're brilliant performances, but Bernard Miles' Joe Gardry is quite, it, it, there's a lot of comic business in it, it's quite broad. And I suppose I wanted to, to, to write a, a Dickens adaptation that was maybe a bit more psychologically dark and, and and tough and grounded. But I don't know if Great Expectations is the book to do that with. I think perhaps you can do that with Little Dorrit or uh, Dombey and Son. I'm not sure if you can do it with Great Expectations, which does have these more almost fairy tale, fantastical elements. So uh, I, I, I think it's an example. I said earlier that a good adaptation isn't necessarily a precy of the novel. And that adaptation is very close to the novel. You know, to the extent that there's a long speech in uh, Jaggers gives, which is pure exposition about uh, how Estella came to be with Miss Havisham and, and her relationship with Magwitch, and it goes on and on and on. Now I think I'd probably be a little bit more uh, liberal uh, and, and tougher with the story. Or I would say, I'm sorry, I love this too much, to do, <laughs> uh, to do the kind of brutal uh, surgery 
that you you need to to get it all into two hours and make it satisfy. So I, I'm very fond of the film. I think the acting is brilliant, but I think my script uh, is probably a bit um, a bit too reverent and uh, conservative. It's not quite the script I wanted to write, which, as I said, was much more grounded uh, and tough. And you know, I always thought it wanted to be like The Godfather or something, really, really, really dark and real. Uh, much more like the Christine Ed's uh, Little Dorrit adaptation, but I don't think I managed to put that on the page. Um, so I'm going to turn to audience questions shortly, um, but um, belated congratulations as well on the BAFTA win for Patrick Thank Bowen. you. Thank you. Um, that series and us really represent the two halves of your screenwriting career, I would say. Um, the, the bittersweet dramatizations of your own books and darker, more difficult adaptations of other people. Is that fair? I think it is now, yeah. I think uh, when I started out, I, I probably was more drawn to uh, a, a kind of lighter, brighter romantic comedy style that I'm, I'm not sure I can do now. I'd like to do it again. But I, I, it's not the. It's not you. You write both in your adaptations and and and, and my own original stories. You write about your preoccupations, and inevitably the preoccupations of a fifty-four-year-old man are different from those of a twenty-eight-year-old starting out. So um, they have got sadder in lots of ways, and maybe darker. Um, I could never write an original work like Patrick Mauro's, but I I can sort of see uh, a kind of maybe something concealed in it that, I, that, that is closer to my original work. Um, various themes of class and father-son relationships and, and redemption and good intentions gone wrong. You know, they are in there, buried in there. But um, I think that, yeah, I, I am drawn now to darker, sadder, more melancholy things, I'm afraid. Um. I know you've written adaptations of other people's books which haven't been produced. Which is the one you would most like to see made? Well, uh, I think perhaps this has changed. I mean, there are just one or two kind of lurking around. I, I, I love uh, Scott Fitzgerald's Tender as the Night. You know, I think it's a very underrated book, but it's a, it's a huge epic. You know, it, again, it has great time leaps, younger, older versions of the same characters. Um, it's extraordinarily downbeat, you know, it's about mental illness and uh, incest and alcoholism and failure. It has a terrible dying fall, you know, the last third is about someone uh, succumbing to their, their worst qualities and, and, and fading away. And fading away is a really hard thing to put in a film that will have to cost $50 million. So I'm not sure it will ever happen. I think there's a mismatch between the nature of the story and perhaps the, the, the subject matter and the mood of the piece, which is, which is pretty tough and sad. Um, but um, uh, I'm not sure if that'll ever happen. It's a good script. And there's one other lurking around, which I think I can talk about. I think it's, it's been mentioned, uh, which is an adaptation of Danny, the champion of the world. Oh, great. By Roald Dahl. Yeah, I think I'm allowed to say that. I may just have got in trouble, but... Uh, it's a long way from happening, but I, I, I'm I'm really proud of the script, and that is, I haven't done the gloomy doomy version of that. It's 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 um, it is obviously has has melancholy elements, but it's hopefully it's the first thing I've written for younger people, and uh, I'm really uh, fond of it. it the, the book is um, uh, a book I read as an adult, not as a child, and and I found it very affecting and and fun. And uh, hopefully that's going to come across if we ever make, if it ever makes it on the screen, that'll come across. Um, okay, so I'm just going to turn, turn to the audience questions now. Um, forgive me in advance if I don't cover all of these and I'm going to sort of um, do a fast pick and choose. Um, so this one's quite interesting. Um, uh, question from uh, Paul Carenza Young. Um, I'd love to know re-outlining. Uh, do you have a different approach to outlining when writing a novel versus writing a screenplay? Uh, that's interesting. It depends on the nature of the novel. Um, one day was a you know a jigsaw puzzle because you didn't have. It wasn't just that you had to know the, what happened on those days. You had to know the three hundred and sixty-four days either side. You had to write plotted biographies of not just Emma and Dexter but everyone in it for twenty years. You know, it was a big kind of. I didn't pin cards to the wall, but there was a lot of planning very detailed synopsis. Something like Sweet Sorrow, which is less plot-led and more of a mood and atmosphere, uh, a feeling, if you like, 
um, was um, was prepared, but it was prepared in a kind of scrapbook format. I wrote about 70,000 words of, of observations and little snatches of dialogue of character sketches and put it away and then whittled it down to 20,000 words. And then the story kind of came out of that. So there was a much more rudimentary uh, beat list almost you know, because two people falling in love, you don't plot it in quite the same way. It's about looks and smiles and jokes and and uh, confidences and all of those things. So it, it wouldn't quite work if to have a wall child approach. But I do, what is universally true of everything I write is I know pretty much the whole thing before I start writing it. I know what's gonna happen. And more importantly, I know what I want it to feel like. You know, I want what I want the mood to be, what the emotion, the response to be, as much as what I want to happen scene by scene. Um. This is quite an interesting one too, um, from Jonathan. Um, are there any differences uh, working with an American network on, a, on an adaptation or a show versus um, writing for a British channel? Well, uh, I suppose instinctively the, the, the prejudice would be that, you know, that there was, uh, that there was more perhaps American channels, uh, maybe, maybe this isn't the case, more conservative or more worried about a, a voice or darkness or ambiguity and that, that wasn't my experience on Melrose. Melrose is the only time I've really experienced that. I started at 10 was produced by Playtone by Tom Hanks uh, was the producer on that and again um, what they liked in the material was its kind of Britishness and and certainly working with Showtime on Melrose there were very few you know, American television the best of American television is is goes places that it goes everywhere, you know, it, it's not scared, it's not frightened, it's not conservative. So I think uh, certainly now in the age of streaming that that isn't the case, though it may well have been in the past, but my experience of working with American producers, apart from occasional arguments about, you know, whether you should you call a zebra crossing a zebra crossing, you know, things like that, things that are just gonna cause an American audience to, to, to be taken out of it for a moment, uh, you know, that comes up, but not, questions of taste or decency or accessibility or likability, all of that. So I think sometimes that perception of um, American producers is, is, uh, is not entirely accurate or is unfair. Um, I'm gonna sort of conflate several different questions into mm. one here, um, which is effectively um, how, when faced with a novel that you're adapting, how do you decide what to keep and what to lose, what, what narrative arcs to follow and what to discard. Is there a sort of, you know, do you, what, what's the first thing you do, you know, as you're, as you're reading it? How do you set mm. about that very complicated process? And that might be a how long is a piece of string question, but nonetheless. No, it's interesting. I mean, when you, when you read a book and you love it and you say to someone, you've got to read this, it's this. That's what I'm trying to keep hold of. You know, uh, with Melrose, I loved the fact that I loved the, the 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 sharpness and wickedness of it, but that also that it was you know a, a very cynical world, a world where people were never sentimental, where sentimentality is sentimentality is sort of stamped on, and yet the books were profoundly affecting and moving to me, but very very funny and deeply sad and affecting, and that's what I and shocking and 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 powerful, and that's what I wanted to keep hold of. With Hardy, you know, it's that sense of if only. Uh, you know, if only the letter hadn't gone under the doormat, if only Angel had danced with Tess all those years ago, if only, if only, if only, a sense of thwarted happiness that, uh, and so you, what you retain are the, are the beats, the moments that, that, um, that, that convey that. So a lot of it is what do you love about this and how can you persuade uh, the viewer of this, uh, of the wonderful nature of this story? You know, with Hardy, it's it's hard because um, Hardy's novels are a series of extraordinary set pieces, which are very, very visual and dramatic, almost operatic, encounters on the heat. You know, when you think of a Hardy novel, you think of, you know, when I think of Tess, I think of, well, the opening chapter is an inciting instant. It's the Reverend telling Tess's father that they're aristocrats. That's the first opening scene. So of course you're gonna keep that. Uh, then you have the brilliant thing of the horse, uh, being impaled, of course you're going to have to have that. Then you have the wonderful uh, old lady with the um, Alex mother with the birds in the cages, you have to have that. And then you have the extraordinary scene with the strawberry. Well, everyone remembers the strawberry, you've got to have the strawberry. Then there's the queen of spades with treacle down her back, you've got to have that. So uh, 
every time I think of Far From the Madding Crowd or Test, that's how I think of it. Brilliant, 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 brilliant. And it's very, very, very hard to lose things. Uh, and, and actually in both films, they're pretty much there in the order that they're written because Hardy had those, um, had a terrific control over narrative grip and wrote brilliant, vivid visual set pieces. So um, what you, I'm sorry, it's a long answer, but a lot of what you're gonna lose page count wise with Hardy are, well, with Far From The Madding Crowd, I never really loved the, the kind of, the, the, the sort of, um, the, 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 the portrait of uh, rural life, you know, the kind of, the sort of the equivalent of Bottom and the Underlings in Midsummer Night's Dream. I never really loved that. So uh, I didn't, th and I didn't think anyone who loved the book loved that comedy. So all of that went very quickly. I did notice and... that it had gone <laughs> when I watched it this last time. I thought, oh, he's, yeah. he's cut all that. And that's a very yeah. sensible Which isn't to say, it doesn't, I don't know, maybe there are great fans of those scenes in, in, in the novel, but I, I, I mean, they're all, and it's fine because they're still in the novel. And they're also all there in the Schlesinger film, which is an hour longer and which, uh, which cuts nothing at all. It's very, very close to, it's almost page by page, apart from the opening. So um, yeah, you, you retain what you love and you try and convey that love to the audience. Uh, now this is an interesting question um, from Callum Harland. Um, again, I suppose it could apply as much to novels as screenplays, but maybe if you want to slant your answer towards screen. Okay. When writing, do you find that theme is something you consciously add into the story or is it something that you add unconsciously and then observe later? I think often at the end you can look back and you can say, oh, that's interesting that I, I, I wrote so much about that, that I became so interested in that notion that wasn't in the plan. But no, I, I know what I sort of know what they're about as well. As much as I know as what happens, I know what I want to explore. Um, but there are exceptions to that. You know, at the end of writing Sweet Sorrow, sorry, I'm just playing with my gadgets. I, uh, I was surprised how, how much more there was of the father-son relationship uh, than I expected and much more about um, undiagnosed depression and what it's like to live with someone who has that and uh, to be forced into the role of carer when you're not quite ready. You know, that's a bigger part of the book than I'd expected looking at my very rough outline. So you can be surprised at the direction the book takes, but only to a degree, you know, a, a lot of people, uh, I think maybe it's much rarer for screenwriters to improvise a screenplay. I think probably they do have certain, certainly story beats, but probably a, a sense of the ideas they want to explore because it's such a structural form. But a novel can take you off on uh, down uh, interesting alleys, some of which um, aren't, as interesting to the reader as they are to you. You know, probably if I was doing a cut uh, going through Sweet Sorrow again, I would pull back on some of those things which at the time of writing really obsessed me. But um, I, that may be a little bit too much of it, I don't know. I mean, I love that book very much. And uh, uh, my reasons for loving it are probably different for, for, from readers. Um. This is a good one. Mark Klompus, when adapting, do you ever think you do you ever feel that you're improving on the original? No, but I do sometimes like to think that Thomas Hardy is in the pitch meeting and I've got a great idea for him and he's going to buy it. You know, I think I, I don't want the I don't want the writers to be upset. I don't want the original writers to be upset. And that's I've only had, I've had that experience twice with Blake Morrison and Edward St. Auburn, and I think they were broadly happy with, with the finished versions. But um, no, I think, here's an example. In Far From The Madding Crowd, um, there's a scene where they're dipping sheep uh, and um, uh, Bathsheba comes along on horseback and she uh, makes a joke and Gabriel says, well, why, why don't you come join us then? And in the novel, Boldwood arrives and she trots off with Boldwood and, and he proposes marriage. and in the script, I thought, well, you, if you're gonna have these sheep, she's got to get in there. And so she does take the challenge from Gabriel and uh, get off, gets off her horse and goes into the, the you know, pushes the sheep through and works alongside her, her, her staff. And that seemed to me like, if you didn't know the book, you wouldn't know that I'd made that up. 
uh, it would feel as if it fitted with the story because it gives you this nice little comic moment where Boldwood comes along and sees that she's soaking wet and surrounded by men. And, you know, it's a nice little piece of social comedy as well as visually much more interesting because without it, I don't know why you'd get all these sheep together. Why would you spend all that time filming it? So I think, I like to think that Thomas Hardy, if he saw that, he wouldn't mind. But he has got a different job because I, the reason it works in the film is because you need to move things on so much faster than in the novel. In the novel, she's still at a rather prickly stage of her relationship with Gabriel. But in the film, you need to get over that. And so that's how I would justify it to Thomas Hardy in this fictional 19th century script meeting. But I don't think you're ever, uh, I don't think of it as improving. I think of, I, I want to make intelligent alterations, I hope. Um, this is an aside, but Thomas Hardy saw a screen adaptation of Tess of the Durbervilles at the Odeon Marble Arch. I still, I, I, I find <laughs> I can't get, quite get my head around that, but Thomas Hardy I, long enough to see uh, Tess um, adapted for the first time. Yeah, and I may be wrong, but I don't think it was even for the first time, I think it was the second screen version of Tess. And he was very upset. The thing that, that annoyed him was that the cows weren't right. You know, they'd obviously shot it in America, so the cows were all kind of long-horned. But um, I want to avoid that. Uh, I, I, I do want the... the, uh, the uh, Edward St. Alban was extremely open-minded and supportive in the changes that I'd made, which must, at times, I'm sure, have been very difficult uh, for him because when you write a book, there's a kind of hidden story behind the book, which is that, that all of the experiences that, that provoked and inspired the book and all of the real life people, even if you're not writing autobiograph directly autobiographically, there's a hidden story behind every novel, even if novelists deny it. There's a whole set of inspirations and experiences. And for someone else to come along and you know combine three distinct characters into one or cut an extremely important moment in, in your real life, you know, that's that's a tough thing to accept. But I, I'm lucky in my two experiences of working with, with living writers that they've been very supportive of the process. And I hope pleased um, with the results. Since we started slightly late because there were so many people wanting to hear you speak, David, so I hope people won't mind if I overrun slightly to three minutes. No, I, um, I'm fine, thank you. I'm sorry I keep playing with my hair. I'm so embarrassed by it. I should have just put a hat on and left it alone. It's it's horrible to watch. I'll well done what I did. <laughs> oh, that. Um, question here from uh, Mairead Maguire. Um, what do you find the most frustrating when writing screenplays, whether that be adapting your own novels or other novels? Um, page count is really annoying because you always have this sort of finishing post, you know, that you've got to get to 120 pages. Screenwriters are always finding all kinds of tricks for this. If, condensing you know the dialogue boxes so it's more tightly laid out on the page than it should be and and you're always you're always thinking about uh cutting 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 and that is hard uh and uh, often uh you will try and squeeze something in in a way that is unnatural uh there was a bit in us the novel us where douglas gives a potted history of art from the beginning of art to the end of art he does it in a paragraph like that and it was a chapter that I liked and people who read it liked it. And they kept saying, can, we, can you have him just say it? You know, just have him say it as they're walking around the Louvre. It would be funny. Tom can do it brilliantly. And we were constantly trying to crowbar this in. And it never, ever worked because, because it was, well, for two reasons. It was an interior monologue. And you thought, and, and we think differently from how we speak. And it required that Saskia did not say anything for quite a long period of time not respond and then you weren't sure what her response would be whether it would be amusement or frustration at her husband's philistine attitude and it just was entirely unnatural it didn't really work it was there was it was just lifting a little loved piece of prose and cramming it into a different medium and so that's the hardest thing is losing metaphors or uh, observations or uh, little uh, sensory moments uh, that just don't translate. Um, but screenwriting is a craft and a, and a lot of it is soaring through things and throwing them away. 
I'm going to apologise again to everyone whose questions I'm not going to be able to get to. I'm just going to try and chip off two or three more before we. Yeah, if you do, uh, if you, if it's, if I will try and I spend too much time on social media anyway. So if if it's really pressing, drop me a line um, on social media and I'll try and answer them. But sorry, I to go ahead. That's all right. Um, have you ever considered directing? The way you talk about editing and soundtracks and performance, it sounds like you consider all the elements of production. Would you like to have that control and responsibility? So that's from Olivia Fitzsimmons. Mm, that's really interesting. I think the honest answer is I would have liked to have done it. Um, but uh, I would have been, I would have hated to feel like a dilettante, you know, because there are a lot of brilliant directors out there who need a gig and uh, uh, authors, uh, you're dabbling. I don't know. Unless you want to commit to it, I think it, it can be a little. I would have felt a bit selfish doing it, and I think also you need a kind of um, a certain. I, I, I think the stereotype of director stomping about like Cecil B. DeMille and ordering people around and firing people needn't be the case. But I don't know if I was ever if I was quite cut out to the for the kind of authoritative confidence that a that a good director inspires in a crew. Um, I would have liked the chance to work with actors, but at the same time, I get very tongue-tied and nervous and starstruck with actors. So I'm not sure I'd have ever been tough enough to do what a director has to do, which is to say, no, I'm not very good at saying no to famous people. <laughs> and that's, you know, that would have been part of the job. So um, it's probably just as well I didn't, but at the same time, it may well be, you know, uh, at the end of my career, I'll look back and say, it's a shame you didn't, uh, you couldn't find that, um, confidence and, and and push us up forward the other thing to say is it would be you know even for quite a, a, a small number of television hours it would be six nine months out of my writing time a year and I love writing uh, the moment I realized I really couldn't do it was watching watching directors get feedback on early cuts of you know previews of the film where you sit behind the screen and you and the audience members say I hated uh, the ending and uh, I, I didn't like that performance. And um, it looks really ugly. I mean, I, I, that has never happened with anything I've made, but you do have to have very, 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 very thick skin to be a director. You do have to be a writer as well, but a director for a feature film, you are right out there in the front, taking both the praise and the, the harshness as well. And I don't think I'm cut out for that. Um. A couple of people have asked whether there are any recent adaptations that you would cite as, as you know, examples of fantastic adaptations. I, I can think of at least one off the top of my head. What would be what would be your yeah. answer to that? Any oh, that's really stuck in your mind lately? I thought Moria did a great job on the dig. I thought that was really lovely, uh, beautifully adapted, and really well uh, uh, directed as well. It, it was you know a period drama but they were using these lovely wide lenses to make it feel slightly different slightly unlike things you'd seen before um uh, as soon as this conversation is over i'm going to have a great list of of, of really brilliant adaptations uh, uh but um i don't have them to hand oh uh, here's a, uh, my edward berger who directed melrose uh um di directed the terror which i think is adapted from a non-fiction book and I think that's extraordinary. That's really, really, really well uh, adapted. And I'm sorry, I don't know the name of the screenwriter, but that's really, really well done. Um, it feels both very contemporary and very authentic as well, which is a really hard thing to pull off with, with period dramas. So I love the terror. So the dig and the terror, those would be my, my two. I can think of one, um, which someone has suggested, um, Armando and she's David Copperfield. Oh, yeah, I think that which was, is that a was great. wonderful, yeah. radical, um, yeah. you know, very personal. It's called Personal History. I always thought that was interesting that he chose to use the full title, Personal History, because that is Amano yeah. way of saying, right, this ain't going to be a normal version of Copperfield. No, I, th I thought that was great. And, uh, and of course, a little bit of me was a little bit jealous of it as well. But Simon Blackwell, I think, did the script as well. But I think they did find a true Dickensian spirit. I suppose the only thing I'd say about that is you can do that with David Copperfield, you know, because it has a, it's an early work and it has a kind of exuberance and the, the characters, you know, Macabre and and you are a heap, you know, they have a kind of scale to them. And I'd love to find, I don't desperately want to do this, but I do think I, that the Dickens I love, uh, uh, the later novels, Great Expectations onwards, really. Uh, I think Our Mutual Friend is an amazing book. And that's like a Dostoevsky novel. 
you know, it's very dark, not throughout, but in places. Uh, the character of Bradley Headstone in that is extraordinary. It's a very underrated book. So Bleak House, Little Dorrit, Our Mutual Friend, I think you'd need to find a, a different approach, which wasn't so wonderfully Dickensian. But yes, I think that David Copperfield is exemplary. And also a, a brilliant example of being tough with the story, tough with the material. It's a 900 page novel and they do get through it in two hours without that feeling of betrayal from an audience. Um, Olivia Hetry, former Guild president, hello Olivia, has suggested Shirley, a kind of hybrid bio-adaptation. I'm not actually familiar with that one. Um, Shirley, the, um, the, the, um, the, 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 uh, the, the, the Bronte, is it, it's a Bronte novel, isn't it? Sorry, Shirley, yes. Oh, Shirley, oh, Shirley Jackson, the, the Shirley Jackson. Uh, yes, there's a, a yes, biopic yes, of Shirley Jackson. Yes, Yeah, yes, I have a, I have a, a myself not uh, it doesn't apply to other writers it's purely myself i'm not very good at um based on a true story is a bit of a, a a stop sign for me because i i am i partly probably laziness around the research but but that obligation to accurately replicate someone's life i think is a very tricky thing you're always going to have those um uh responses which are you know what happened to shirley jackson's children i think in the case of that film where they uh, they weren't featured even though they existed in real life. It's a really tricky thing. I think you need a kind of audacity and confidence in, um, in biopics to, 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 to accept that this isn't documentary, that you are going to make stuff up and embrace it. And I'm, I'm a bit nervous about that, um, which is why I've never really done one except for probably, and when did you last see your father is the nearest I've got. I remember watching... Um... A theory of everything and being incredibly impressed with it as a screenplay and it is it, 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 it hits every beat that you would need to in yeah. order to really connect with an audience and I also remember thinking I would not have written it that way and I'm sure that my draft would have been rewritten if I had done it I would have turned in something much closer to reality and they'd have said yeah. yes thank you very much indeed we need I to make all these changes and the I mean, whose life has an inciting not. incident? No one has three acts. You know, no has. <laughs> we don't. We don't think of uh, 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 real life doesn't have those kind of structures. They get, you know, well, they do come to an end, but they don't have a satisfying ending necessarily. So, uh, it's a really hard skill, and 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 other writers do it very well, but I, I can't do it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw in one more question, then, and I'm okay. going to uh, tie up. And with apologies to the dean for overrunning. Um, See if I can find it now. Uh, bear with me. Here we are. Yes, I, uh, this is interesting because I think it would loop back to us actually. Um, Ruth Moore, do you like to write or rewrite to suit the voice slash style of actors you know are involved in a project? Now, this interests me because reading the Us scripts this morning, I was struck by. Um, the stage directions are very sparse. Um, you yeah. sketch in the characters and the locations, but you let the dialogue, which have, you know, you've been writing great dialogue since Cold Feet. It's really, really um, light, and um, you just race through it. Really, I mean, I read those scripts really fast, Thank but you. you let the dialogue do the heavy lifting. So, and I was sort of interested, and that's not the case with your scripts. For I've, I've read your scripts for. Um, bits of your scripts from Melrose and Far From the Madding Crowd and, and Great Expectations, they're much denser. So perhaps you could talk yeah. a little bit about that, Ruth's question, in relation yeah. to us, perhaps. Performers. Yes. I, will re I will rewrite with act once the actor is cast, yes, but often quite minimally. I mean, Benedict, you know, has a, in Melrose has a, a certain tone of voice and mannerism. You know there are things he's going to do brilliantly. Likewise, Tom uh, with us, you know, Tom Honda was on board quite early uh, as a producer as well as a, a, a performer. So the dialogue, not consciously, but I'm sure when I've done passes, I thought oh, it would be great if Tom gives it that little twist or Tom, you know, Tom has a great deadpan uh, comedy, comic quality. So yes, it, I, I like writing for actors uh, with a voice and with a mannerism in mind. And often when I'm writing an, even a novel, I will think of, you know, a kind of physicality that comes from, Jack Lemmon or Catherine Hepburn or you know, not necessarily the actor who will play the role but an actor who will embody the qualities which I want to get on the page so I, 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 I do think I, tr I, I try and get a sense of performance even when I'm writing prose. I'm afraid our time is up um, 
if you want to hear more from David, he's one of 12 terrific screenwriters in uh, The Art of Screen Adaptation. This is the shameless self-promotion moment, sorry. Um, and until the end of March, uh, there's 25% off the book if you order via the Creative Essentials website, quoting voucher code CE25 at the checkout. So there you go. You'll find the links to the Creative Essentials website on my Twitter bio, which is at Alistair Writer, um, and on my own website, um, alistairownwriter.com. Um, this interview, as I'm sure Nadine will go on to tell you, will be available on the Writer Skill uh, YouTube channel, along with my previous Q&As with Moira Buffini, where we talked about The Dig, um, and former Guild President Olivia Headread, uh, where she turned the tables and interviewed me. Um, and the previous interviews in the series, uh, before we had the bright idea of partnering with the lovely people at the Guild, um, can also be accessed via my website, um, Hossein Amini, talking about adapting James Salis's novel Drive, and screenwriter Jeremy Brock discussing non-fiction adaptations. Finally, as ever, a big thank you to the Guild for hosting this event. Um, a bigger thank you to all of you for taking the time to come and watch. And naturally, the biggest thank you to David for taking the time to talk to us. David, thank you very much. Thank you, Alistair, and thank you everyone for coming. I, I, most have spoken for six months, <laughs> so thank you. <laughs>